Next month, tragically, it looks as if the world will mark the one-year anniversary of Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine. It's been merciless, unrelenting, horrific, pick your adjective, but as Ukraine continues its remarkable resistance to the invasion and more and more military aid flows from Western powers to help, is there any hope for peace soon? With us now on that, let's welcome in Vienna, Austria, Velina Chakarova, director of the Austrian Institute for Europe and Security Policy. In Midtown Manhattan in New York City, Walter Russell Mead, the Ravenel B. Curry III Distinguished Fellow in Strategy and Statesmanship at the Hudson Institute. And here in our studio, Janice Stein, Bellsberg Professor of Conflict Management and founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Janice, great to have you back here, first thing here in the new year. And to our two guests out of town, we're grateful you could join us for this important discussion as well. Walter, I want to start with you because you recently came out with a column in the Wall Street Journal called, It's Time to Prepare for Ukrainian Peace. And you had five criteria in that that the United States would like to see if peace were to happen. And let's just quickly share those with our viewers here. Point number one, the war, you say, should end quickly. Number two, the war should end in true peace. Number three, the end of the war shouldn't set the stage for the next war. Four, the end should make clear that Russia's aggression did not go unpunished. And five, the war should not end with the dismemberment of the Russian Federation. Okay, we are going to pick these apart as we go through our discussion here. But, Walter, let me start with this. Absent from your list is whether the territorial integrity of Ukraine needs to be respected. How come that's not on the list? Because it seemed to me, Steve, that, that we're going to end up uh, trying to deal with the military situation on the ground we can't predict at this point what it is, what that will be, but we have to start thinking about now what we want as an after state. Um, you know, per, my, if you ask me my personal preference, it is Ukrainian territorial integrity on the 1991 lines to be reestablished. But the god of war may speak uh, about something else. All right, let's pick another one of your points here. The end of the war shouldn't set the stage for the next war. How does the world, in your view, make sure that that doesn't happen? Well, there's several things. One is that clearly the security guarantees that Ukraine had in 1995 and subsequently were not sufficient. Uh, maybe we're talking formal NATO membership. Maybe we're talking about some other form of, of treaty ironclad guarantee, but Ukraine needs, Ukraine needs to come out of this war with recognized, defended boundaries and the diplomatic and military backing, if need be, to protect its independence. Let me follow up with Valina on that, because one of the points, number two, is the war should end in true peace. Valina, when you hear the expression true peace as it relates to Ukraine and Russia, what does that mean to you? Well, first and foremost, uh, obviously, uh, the uh, goals uh, of uh, Ukraine and Russia in this war are um, are quite uh, opposite. So that means that uh, there will be true peace once uh, Ukraine wins over Russia, or uh, that will be, of course, the ideal case, or Russia uh, at least partially achieves its goals in the war. So there won't be a peace treaty so long as Russian troops are on Ukrainian territory. Uh, Ukraine has only two options uh, as of today, um, ahead of the first anniversary, namely between a war or a complete subjugation. So um, the option of the war right now is the better option from Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's point of view. But even from Russian point of view, as of today, at least uh, the minimum goal would be to establish control over the Donbass region. Uh, and uh, that is still not the case. 40% uh, of the Donbass region, including Donetsk and Lugansk, is actually not under a Control. So uh, to um, uh, wrap it up, uh, we are far away from uh, true peace uh, as of uh, today and ahead of the first anniversary. And of course, decision makers in the West, in Europe, in the United States and other partners do want to see 
the options between war and peace. But like I said, uh, we have to face the reality as it is and not to, um, well, to uh, think in normative uh, terms. Janice, can you imagine a quote-unquote true peace that allows Russian troops to remain in the eastern part of Ukraine? That is one of the two biggest challenges here, uh, Steve. The other is, of course, Crimea, which is even more difficult uh, to think about because Crimea was annexed by Russia in 2014. So when I look at Walter's five conditions, uh, we are very far away. And some of them, in fact, may never be achievable. But I think... Um, Walter, you're making a more fundamental point that we tend to think of this, Steve, as fight or make peace, <laughs> fight or prepare for negotiations. That's not accurate. It is fight and prepare Both for negotiations. simultaneously. Yeah, and I think we are not doing enough now of the hard preliminary work uh, to get ready uh, and to provide the kinds of options first and foremost to the United States, which plays an extraordinary role in this whole story, um, but even to engage uh, indirectly both responsible Ukrainians and responsible Russians in these kinds of discussions, which always take place long before they become official. We're not doing enough. Let me get Walter on that. Do you think, uh, do you agree with Janice that there's not enough going on diplomatically behind the scenes to lay the groundwork for the five conditions you've put in place? Well, as always, I think Janice cuts right to the chase. And uh, the, she made, I think, really just excellent points, as usual. Uh, we're, the thing is that, you know, in World War II, and I wrote about this in the column, you know, the, the Allies had, al the Americans had already begun to think about how to end World War II before we were in it. So that Roosevelt and Churchill signed the Atlantic Charter before the United States was at war. So thinking about what you want from peace and thinking about what you want the outcome of the war to, to, to be is something that, that you should be doing from the beginning. Janice's additional point, which is very strong, is that there needs to be some kind of communication, back-channel communication. People sometimes talk about things like Track 2, Track 1.5. The trouble is in today's Russia, uh, you can't, there's not a lot of room for people that want to be part of those track 1.5 or track 2 conversations. Putin does not, is not at the, at the moment interested in having people explore back channels. There are, however, people in Russia who are known in the West, who um, are, are, are serious thinkers. We should be engaged with them, but again, not over the heads of the Ukrainians. Uh, the Americans, uh, we need, you know, everybody involved in this war needs to be thinking about what do we want to come afterwards. By true peace, by the way, I don't mean sitting together and singing Kumbaya, <laughs> but what I do mean is that what we don't want is 2014 2.0. Or in other words, Russia is holding some territory, the legal status is, is disputed, and we are putting Russia under all kinds of sanctions. Uh, what we want is a return to sort of normal international life. Now, when I list these five things, I don't think we're going to get them quickly. Uh, and as Janice points out, we may not get some of them at all, but, but it's what we need to think about what we want and then do what we can to get as close to that as possible. Valina, let me get you to react to a view from the United Kingdom. This is from someone named Julian Lindley French, a geopolitical analyst, who had the following to say, There is no reason to believe Moscow will seek any peace agreement worthy of the name in the short term, and any calls for a ceasefire would merely consolidate Russian gains. Rather, Russia will attempt to coerce both Ukraine into submission and outlast Western partners. Moscow believes lack the strategic patience and political cohesion for a long war. Could you, Valina, tell us what your view of the so-called strategic patience is of the Western and or NATO countries? 
Well, first, I absolutely agree with uh, this opinion uh, of my colleague. Um, and uh, in fact, it's important to understand that uh, the short term game of Russia is exactly uh, this to actually present itself as the rational player. Uh, which seeks peace talks, which uh, offers a ceasefire, um, as it happened during Christmas time, and uh, at the same time to present Ukraine as the irrational player that seeks a prolongation of the war. And by doing so, so uh, we need to understand, given the experience from previous frozen conflicts and uh, wars that Russia conducted in Eastern Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, but also in Eastern Europe, that uh, this kind of uh, uh, breaks, uh, frozen conflicts, and so on, are in fact the perfect excuse to legitimize already um, the, the already, um, uh, let's say, um, the territorial gains of Russia. In this case, uh, we talk about 17 percent of the Ukrainian territory. So that is what I was trying to explain that in the short term there will be no. Uh, no uh, peace talks. When it comes to the strategic patience, here this is the second part of the Russian game. Um, Russia is playing for time, is hoping for at least one country uh, in uh, Europe, ideally Germany, uh, so a big, uh, big uh, member state of the European Union, uh, to face a situation of political turmoil. Uh, where a government would, uh, for instance, collapse. Uh, this happened with uh, Italy based on uh, its um, policy towards uh, Russia, but uh, the new coalition government uh, turned out to be even more pro-Ukrainian. And uh, Russia plays for time because it really wants to strike against this uh, uh, strategic patience uh, approach. That means that the Western sanctions are working. It means also that the Western uh, system, so Western uh, weapon systems deliveries are in fact efficient, as we've seen with the two important counter offenses by Ukraine. And um, these two important pillars of the Western approach may produce, may trigger, let's say, a tipping point uh, for the Russian system, for the Russian economy, but also for the Russian war machinery. And this is what Russia tries to prevent. Well, let me pluck from that answer something, and Janice, put it to you, and that is the notion of weapons delivery, because we have seen France announce that they're going to be sending light tanks to Kyiv. The United States and Germany followed a day later, saying they're sending their own armored vehicles to Ukraine. Does this look to you as if those Western powers are still betting on Ukraine? There's no question the Western powers are still betting on Ukraine, um, and to a degree, I think that few thought possible, but let's go back to Walter's comment for a moment here, see, the gods of war are unpredictable, mm. right? So one of the things we know is that the West, including the United States, has depleted its stocks to an, I mean, to an almost unbelievable degree. It, it really is shocking that there were, so, rounds of ammunition are now mm. scarce. Uh, those two were two big announcements. In one case, three tanks, in another case, a few more. Those are not game changers on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. So the reason I said what I did earlier is, frankly, there are multiple outcomes to the, on the battlefield that are foreseeable six months from now. The Ukrainians have fought with incredible bravery, but there is still the capacity in Russia to mobilize. Um, at a significant level. Well, that was the fear over Christmas, wasn't it? That yes. By, calling, by Putin calling this ceasefire, the well, idea was... I, I actually think that was completely unrealistic. You can't mobilize in 36 hours in any meaningful way. That was really done for, for Russian domestic politics. They have it too. Uh, we are not the only ones who have it. But over time, there's certainly... Russia has more to throw at this. Um, it's not exhausted. And the sanctions actually have done shockingly little damage to the Russian economy thus far. So it's in that broader context of uncertainty and unpredictability uh, that we, I'll come back to Walter's point earlier, that we start to do the planning. That is not a pause in fighting. In other words, doing the kind of hard work, thinking hard about trade-offs, because nobody gets everything they want, nobody gets everything they want, doing that policy work uh, and engaging, not over the head of Ukraine, but with Ukraine. Who's supposed to be doing it? 
Well, that's what good governments do. Let me put it to you that way. I think that there are already some back-channel negotiations going on uh, that are appropriately confidential. But I think we need to do much more. And why is this so important, Steve? And Walter actually didn't mention this. You have to get domestic publics ready mm. for results that don't match the rhetoric. And this is a perennial wartime problem. Zelensky is extremely exposed with his own public. They are rightly enraged, but he will have an enormously difficult time. Um, some of the Western governments, and particularly uh, in Eastern Europe, the, the states that are closest to Russia, um, this is, there, there are going to be some very bitter pills to swallow here. Mm -hmm. And if governments aren't doing that work now, they're making their own lives much more difficult at the other end of this. Okay, Walter, I'm going to get you back in here let on me, one of the let items. Let me underline. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I think that I want to double down on this uncertainty thing because it's not just the battles in Ukraine. Suppose the suppose Putin decides to make a, an end run and goes to Iran and says, listen, we'll help you get over the line and debt and, and Iran has a nuclear test. How does that change where America is, what it thinks about in terms of its of how many arms it can send to Ukraine? Suppose China declares a blockade of Taiwan. There are a lot of things that nobody controls that could shake up the chessboard enormously. And, you know, the surprises could go the other way, too. Russians could start deserting in droves from their units. But war is, by definition, unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And and we've all, I, I think what we see is a policy discussion and a press discussion that sort of assumes that what we're looking at today is roughly what we'll be looking at in six weeks, 12 weeks, a year. It isn't necessarily. Right. While you've got the floor, Walter, I want to put another one of your five items to you from your Wall Street Journal piece of a month ago, and that is the war should not end with the dismemberment of the Russian Federation. And, um, well, let me read an excerpt here. This is from the deputy director of the International Center for Defense and Security in Tallinn, Estonia, who's written a piece called Don't Be Afraid of a Russian Collapse. Sheldon, would you bring this graphic up? Middle of page three, please. It is ironic that Western Europeans are more afraid of escalation than countries closer to Russia, even though the latter would be directly affected by any escalation of the war. Being the object of Russia's imperial policies from the 1700s to the present day has taught the Baltic countries and Poland to fear Russian strength more than weakness and to fear Russia's potential victory in Ukraine much more than its defeat. The Ukrainians' courage and determination to defend their independence is a historic chance for the United States and Europe to deliver a decisive blow to Russian imperialism and toxic nationalism. But so far, the major Western powers hesitate to throw their weight behind this outcome. Okay, tell us why you think a dismemberment of the Russian Federation is something we should not desire. Well, I'm old enough to remember the collapse of the Soviet Union and at that time, uh, uh, the American government was terrified of thousands of nuclear scientists, nuclear devices running around completely unconstrained. Uh, we did a lot of work, um, some of it wiser than others maybe, but in the end, we managed to contain that. But this, the, the actual dissolution of Russia, let's think about the human cost in the Caucasus, in South, in 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 the part in Chechnya, uh, the wars that might break out between Azerbaijan and Armenia on a much larger scale. Let's think about where China would be, what China might do in that situation. Uh, it's a it's a catastrophe. And then we should also think there are a lot of you know there are millions of Russians who are not responsible in any way for what Putin has done, what happens to them in that situation? Does that actually enhance European security? I agree with the Estonians, the Poles, and the Ukrainians that a, that a strong Russia is a threat to them. That's why I believe in a strong NATO alliance, and I believe that the, that the war should end with Ukraine having ironclad security guarantees. But that... I don't think those, 
it's much harder to protect someone from chaos than from a power. And I, there is nothing to be gained in my mind from the collapse of civil authority and the outbreak of strife and war in Russia. Didn't, didn't, didn't make anybody happy in World War I. I don't think it would make anybody happy today. Let me get Valina. Janice, I'll get to you in a yeah. second. Valina, where do you stand on, this, on the question of this being a unique historic opportunity to deliver a decisive blow to Russian imperialism? Indeed, it is a unique, uh, unique moment, and uh, in fact, uh, we are facing this kind of uh, bifurcation within Europe uh, between the Franco-German bloc, which is pushing for, as I said, the status quo, coming back to the status quo before the war began, which I think is unrealistic. And then, of course, uh, Central Eastern European countries, but also the Nordic countries. Uh, think about the fact that two neutral countries, the one being neutral for the last 250 years, the other for... Uh, you know, for more than 70 years are now joining NATO this year. Uh, this is also showing actually uh, how um, how unique the moment has become. I think that um, um, we all indeed uh, share the same interest on both sides of the Atlantic that, um, in fact, uh, a disem dismemberment of uh, the Russian Federation, dissolution of the Russian Federation, uh, weakening of uh, this uh, imperial uh, project, geopolitical project, is in our uh, common interest uh, for the reason that uh, neither the United States nor the European powers want to face a two-front scenario in the future, given the real challenge coming from uh, China. So this uh, modus vivendi of coordination that I was talking about just a year ago in your show, Steve, ahead of the beginning of the war, this is the real problem, the threat multiplier coming from Moscow and Beijing, while Beijing is realizing that it needs to protect its uh, border in the north. It needs to have security uh, that is guaranteed by Russia while facing uh, rising India and also military escalation with Taiwan. So obviously, uh, a weakened Russian isn't in the interest of the West. And I argue also that um, um, uh, the dissolution of uh, the Russian uh, Federation may present Russians and hopefully the new generation uh, within Russia with uh, new opportunities. We uh, should look at uh, uh, Russia as being under complete control of one specific clique of the KGB-like clique of people. This is not uh, uh, a country that is being ruled by checks and balances the way how the West understands it. And this is not in our interest to have a KGB-like rule country that operates uh, in our direct vicinity. So obviously, uh, we should go for this, uh, for sure. We leave it to Professor Stein to break the tie. Well, I, I disagree. Um, With quite... which one of them? I disagree with Valentina quite strongly. First of all, the argument that uh, the solution to this lies in the dissolution of Russia assumes that any conceivable Russian leader um, is expansionist and imperialist. Not the case, you know. Well, it's, no, it's not the case. You know, Russia has been a power in Europe for centuries. And if you look back at the imperialist expansionist powers, uh, Russia takes its turn with everybody else, but it does not have a monopoly. And so to just make that as the organizing assumption that every, any conceivable Russian leadership is going to be expansionist, I think is questionable. Secondly, um, dissolution brings with it, as Walter says, chaos and risk. And let's talk in detail. Uh, Walter talked about it very briefly. When the Soviet Union broke up, Ukraine had Russian Soviet nuclear weapons on its soil. It took three years of arduous negotiation, and that's where we got the term loose nukes, mm -hmm. right? And loose nuke scientists, uh, and it, it was a priority of the US government, and Ukraine voluntarily gave them up. And by the way, if it hadn't, it might not have found itself in the situation. I was going to say, do you which think they regret finds, that decision I'm today? I'm sure they, they regret do. that mm -hmm. decision. I have no doubt about it. But it was done because of the fear, not of nuclear proliferation from one state to another, but because there would be loose nuclear weapons. Now, I can tell you that there is no part of the Russian Federation that would break away here, and if there are nuclear weapons on their soil, that would return them. 
So just think of the nightmare that the world would face under those kinds mm. of, under that situation. I, I, it's very easy to gloss over this. It's frankly a nightmare and would pose just mm. enormous risk to Central Europeans, to East Europeans, and to everybody else where we define ourselves. I really do not think this is what we should wish for. All right, Walter, let's return to the first point on your list, which is the war should end quickly. And I guess I'd like to start by asking you, what's your definition of quickly? <laughs> and how optimistic are you? Well, I would, <laughs> I would like it to end tomorrow on my terms. Yeah. But uh, yes. that's unlikely. Yeah. I don't think we're going to get a quick end to the war, but I think we should be trying to do what we can to make the end come sooner rather than later. The damage only increases as the war goes on. The crimes committed make, make reconciliation or even stability harder. Uh, the emotions get higher. The damage is greater. And also the, the tests both of Western solidarity and the risks to Russian coherence grow over time. Plus, I think there are other powers out there that are already finding ways to benefit from this situation and will continue to do it. So I think, in, in my view, that really translates now into trying to make, sure, make it clear to Russia that it's not going to win. Putin still believes that he has some options on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think our, our strongest policy, we should be working very hard to, prov to, to check Russia's military operations, to give Ukraine what it needs to, to, to gain. But at the same time, and this is in the context of Janice's earlier remarks, you know, making sure those back channels are open. It's like, Russia, you cannot win, but Russia, we're not trying to destroy right. you. Hmm. And somehow in that space, at some point, hopefully, there is room for some kind of an agreement. But again, by invading Ukraine, Putin has unleashed a torrent of events which neither he nor we can really fully control. So we can have goals. There's no guarantee that we're going to achieve them. But we should be working at it. That at least would be my view. Well, let me follow up on that with two other voices who are urging speed uh, in the end of this thing. And, uh, well, you know their names from national security uh, positions in the past, uh, both out of Washington. We agree with the Biden administration's determination to avoid direct confrontation with Russia. However, an emboldened Putin might not give us that choice. The way to avoid confrontation with Russia in the future is to help Ukraine push back the invader now. That is the lesson of history that should guide us, and it lends urgency to the actions that must be taken before it is too late. Rice and Gates. We know yeah. those names from the past. Uh, okay, Valina, do you want to weigh in on that? Do you uh, share their view on that? Once again, I'm in a very convenient position because I agree with this uh, quote as well. And as I said, as we're speaking, Russia is preparing for the next escalation phase, is mobilizing at least another 100,000 uh, uh, reserve troops, uh, which will be deployed at the front lines, and uh, is applying a kind of a hybrid uh, approach uh, while destroying the critical infrastructure of uh, Ukrainian cities and villages and terrorizing Ukrainian population. It is preparing for the next offense, most likely in Donbas. So we are far, far away from uh, any peace talks. And of course, the minimum goal, once again, will be to legitimize at least those territorial claims uh, and gains uh, that have been achieved so far in the four illegally annexed regions. Um, that means I, uh, that I just don't see any ground for uh, peace talks uh, in the short term. I honestly don't see uh, the war, the war uh, being over in this year. We are in an attrition war. And as I said, uh, both uh, war parties uh, currently convinced that they can decide the outcome of this war uh, in their favor. And I think that the West um, is uh, um, applying the right approach for the moment uh, by 
uh, intensifying the weapons uh, systems deliveries uh, to Ukraine by, uh, meanwhile, um, launching nine packages of sanctions. I think that these uh, together, uh, or let's say coupled with uh, the next uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive, uh, offenses, maybe the next one will be conducted uh, um, also ahead of the anniversary, the first anniversary, or maybe uh, in March. Uh, but uh, definitely, Ukraine is preparing for the next counteroffensive. And um, based well, let me on pick up on that actually, Valina, if I can. We may see. Because yes. we got a minute left to go here, and Janice, I want to put it to you. And uh, the next offensive, the Ukrainian defense ministry is predicting that in the spring, a half a million Rus Russian troops are going to be mobilized for this conflict. What does that do? Well, I don't know. I, you know, I don't think it's half a million, but it's certainly additional Russian troops will be thrown at this. I have no doubt the, the Ukrainians are doing their level best. Um, they are anticipating an offensive as well. So I, I think there's very little doubt that we're going to see, as somebody described it, bloody fighting in a war of attrition in mm. the Donbass that is reminiscent, frankly, of the horrors of World War I, mm. where forces move forward a yard or two and face enormous casualties. So we're going to go through a really, I think, brutal spring. But it's out of those kinds of battles. When did we get discussions going to go back to that war in World War I? When governments made the decision that the price simply was not worth hmm. the gains they were making on the battlefield. And depending on what this spring brings, we may be in a very different strategic um, position after these offensives, and that's why I, it's, you know, I keep saying, let's do some of the hard thinking now. Um, but the battlefield always drives the pace of negotiations. Mm -hmm. But the two go together, Steve. They're not either ors. Understood. I want to thank the three of you for your contributions to our program tonight. Janice Stein from the University of Toronto, Walter Russell Mead from the Hudson Institute, Valina Chakarova from the Austrian Institute for Europe and Security Policy. It's great to have you three with us again. Take care, everybody. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.